starts right now. And we begin with late breaking news on the investigation into a suspected human smuggling operation we first reported earlier this week. A suspect has now been arrested. No other details being released at this time, but the arrest comes a few days after reports of a tractor trailer tanker believed to be carrying several undocumented immigrants. That truck was seen on surveillance video near a truck stop along I-35 in Fisher Road. This investigation is ongoing. It's a story we are continuing to follow. And we are all watching the winter weather moving into South Texas. The potential for snow and ice this weekend. Nothing falling right now, but we're expecting some big changes in the area, and that could have a big impact on our roads. Governor Greg Abbott issuing a disaster declaration for the entire state to speed up help to affected areas. Here's our Adam Kasky with a quick look at the timing for this winter weather. Adam. Yeah, and our biggest concern for big impacts is really in the hill country where they already have some icing on their tree limbs and their branches and even power lines. You add just a little bit more on top of it and it could become very problematic. So that's one big concern in the hill country along, of course, with travel. But that's not just going to be confined to the hill country all across South Texas will be seeing uh, some difficult travel by Sunday night. Between now and then, we've got a little bit to talk about as well. Let's get right to it. It's cold out there right now. We had a high temperature of, get this, 34 degrees today. A whopping 34. That's as warm as it got at the airport. Right now we're 33. Still upper 20s in the hill country. Heard from Bill up in uh, Kerrville, and he says they were below freezing all day. No melting of the ice. Uh, tree limbs are sagging down. Not a good situation. And unfortunately, we are expecting more precipitation on top of it in the days ahead, particularly Sunday night. First things first, though, temperatures, they're cold and they'll be dipping below freezing again, even here in San Antonio later on tonight. Those temperatures will be on the downswing and it'll be a light freeze, but a hard freeze is on the way by tomorrow night. So let's talk about this into tomorrow. Most of the day, low to mid 30s. And notice how we have these little precip chances here. That would be for some cold rain and cold freezing rain, just dotting parts of South Texas periodically throughout the day, especially into the afternoon, creating a few isolated slick spots here and there throughout the day tomorrow. It's going to be a game time decision, depending on if you're venturing out and traveling. Uh, well, I'm going to talk more about this, show you our future cast and really list out things to expect for this weekend and beyond coming right up. Myra. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks, Adam. Well, could this be a preview of the road conditions that we could be dealing with here in South Texas? The freezing temperatures, that wintry mix, bringing Interstate 10 to a complete stop in the Hill Country. This is in Kerr and Kimball counties. The dangerous driving started last night with TxDOT tweeting about some accidents due to icy roads. This morning, the roads pretty much impassable in Junction and Segovia. At one point, TxDOT reported that cars were backed up for 15 miles. Some drivers were stranded for hours. With ice and snow heading our way, outreach workers looking for homeless, especially the homeless who were in those encampments that the city recently dismantled, along with many others. Along with hand warmers, blankets, and tents, they're being told about the more than half a dozen shelters available to them, along with where they can get food and warm clothing. Jesse Degoriato says a community-wide effort is underway to help the city's homeless make it through the frigid nights ahead. As expected, Haven for Hope, the city's largest shelter, already has seen people trying to escape the cold. Yesterday, they enrolled 45 people, including enrolling people after hours to get out of the cold weather. Vela says Haven for Hope can handle a thousand people inside its facilities and more if needed. They've set up space so that they can take in even more people this weekend. Given the icy forecast, they may have to, yet as part of the now five-year-long effort to help the city's homeless population with a coordinated response. Nonprofits and churches also try to do their part. Corazon Ministries downtown at Travis Park Methodist Church can take in 20 people a night and more if needed, but with necessary COVID precautions in place. Social distance, wear two masks and, uh, you know, temperature checks, uh, a limited amount of number of volunteers. He says the shelter here even opened a day early because of how bad the weather got. If it's 36 and wet, that's just as bad as 
32 and dry. Catholic Charities has a mobile relief unit that's feeding warm meals to the homeless with volunteers from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It plans to do the same this weekend. The community itself also is trying to help, providing warm clothing and blankets and other necessities at a time like this. God bless you. Thank you for doing that. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. And check out our website, ksat.com, for a list of the shelters that'll be open. There's also a hotline you can call to volunteer or if you need more information. The San Antonio Fire Department trying to get the word out about making sure people are being safe when trying to heat their homes over the next several days. If you have to use a space heater, they say keep it at least three feet away from anything flammable. Don't use a power strip or an extension cord. Plug it directly into the wall. And when you leave the room, don't just turn it off. Unplug it. As for generators, leave them outside. Don't bring them into the house and never use a stove to heat your home. Since this cold front moved in, firefighters have already responded to house fires started by people trying to stay warm. Fortunately, they haven't been anything you know, devastating, but we've made small fires already that are tied to heating sources. And so it's, we, we talk about it all the time, like you said, but we can't stress it enough how key it is and how important it is because it's preventable. You know, all of this is preventable. We're not talking about a, a shortage and wiring inside your house. We're talking about human error. We have information from CPS Energy on how to keep your home warm the safe way on our website, ksat.com. Over the next several days, there will be a lot of changes in the weather conditions and how those will affect schools, churches, vaccination clinics, a whole lot more. We'll be keeping track of all of it on air and on ksat.com. Just go to the homepage for the latest information on the current weather, the forecast, the closures, cancellations, delays which we will also be running on the ticker at the bottom of the screen during our newscasts. Download the KSAT news and weather apps for the most up-to-date information on the weather in South Texas. 100,000 and counting. That's how many doses of the COVID-19 vaccine University Health distributed through today. This is the 100,000. I got it. Hank Cortez, the lucky one today. University Health has been giving out vaccines for almost two months now. They say figuring out the logistics for the vaccine distribution hasn't been easy, but it's been worth it. As for Hank, he says he got the vaccine today for his family. Uh, I've, I've got uh, grandkids and great grandkids. I would hate to take something to them and, you know, bring them harm. University Health vaccinating people at the Wonderland of the Americas Mall, depending on the allotment from the state, they can do about 4,300 doses a day. The City and San Antonio Police Officers Association began negotiations on a new contract today. Right off the bat, the focus on officer discipline. The union hasn't presented its own requests yet, but the city laid out the broad strokes of its positions. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger takes us into the first day of these talks. Contract talks between the City of San Antonio and the San Antonio Police Officers Association are beginning after months of protests and calls for changes to the department. So the city's goals are no surprise. Discipline is our top priority for these negotiations. That includes changing the time frame for issuing discipline, letting the chief consider all past conduct, and restricting accused officers' access to the evidence against them before being interviewed. Then there's the big one, limiting appeals to the facts of the case and not the level of discipline doled out meaning an arbitrator couldn't decide the chief was too strict and turn a firing into a suspension. We want the final discipline to be assessed by the chief or the city manager. So that looks like it will be one of the tougher sells. If you don't believe they can never win, well then okay, then Stalin had the same dang system. We had a trial, but you're going to get shot. We have a system that gives you a running shot at getting your job back. These negotiations also face something of a ticking clock. A vote to repeal a state statute that gives officers the power to collectively bargain for a contract is on the May 1st ballot. If voters approve it and a new contract isn't finalized by the time the election is canvassed, there won't be a new contract. SAPD would revert to scaled down policies and procedures when the current contract expires this fall. In the meantime, both sides say they plan to negotiate in good faith. Both sides agreed to meet here for the next round of negotiations a week from today on the 19th. I'm Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. This is near downtown I-10 at the Y, the fine silver building off to the left there to give you an idea of what we're looking at. And you can see traffic moving very smoothly, but these are some of those roadways where it gets wet 
gets cold, you worry about Absolutely. the black ice. Yeah. It's not a good scene when that happens, Adam. That's a lot of the questions over the next few days, right? And unfortunately, San Antonio, so much of it is elevated roadways, which is obviously more problematic because it's surrounded by colder air and not insulated a little bit by the ground. But I do think all roadways will become problematic into Sunday night. Today, the warmest we got was 36, actually. So 36, our high temperature. That's a good 30 degrees below average and we started the day at 32. So let's take a look at our morning temperatures as we go forward here. Tomorrow will be right below freezing Sunday upper 20s. Look at Monday morning 19 degrees and by Tuesday we're down to 14. So obviously the necessary precautions for a hard freeze in the days ahead. Kids I know you want some snow. I think odds are favoring snowfall. We'll talk more about how much we could see, when it's going to come, and uh, more reminders and what to expect and time it out for you coming right up. Just about time now for the daily briefing on COVID-19 cases in our area. Of course, we talked about earlier how this winter weather is having an impact on the pandemic in terms of delaying some of those vaccination appointments that were scheduled for Monday. As a reminder, you can go to our website and check out uh, how those appointments will be delayed. As far as the numbers go, things have been headed in the right direction for us. Absolutely. Let's go to the mayor and the county judge live from City Hall right now. An update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 716 new cases of COVID-19, which brings the overall case total to 187,062. Our seven-day rolling average has now dropped to 746. Unfortunately, there are nine new deaths to report this evening, um, including one pediatric fatality. Uh, please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. As you know, uh, many of our family members and neighbors are reeling from the loss of a loved one over the last many months. It's been a deadly few months for us, so please keep them in your thoughts and prayers tonight. We do continue to see positive signs in our hospitals. There are now 767 patients in area hospitals. Uh, there were 79 admissions in the last 24 hours, so that number has gone down uh, quite a bit over the last week and 306 patients are in the ICU, 164 on ventilators. Overall, uh, an update on vaccines this evening. As of February 10th, 2021, 186,059 people have received their first dose. Uh, so very soon we will be uh, in our community have more people vaccinated than actually cases uh, throughout this pandemic, and that will be a good threshold to cross. Uh, 74,559 people now have been fully vaccinated in Bear County. Let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Well, thank you. It was really good to see the hospital numbers uh, come down uh, within 24 days. Um, uh, we have taken a high from high of 1,520 in the hospital to 767, cut it almost in half in 24 days. So we got to continue to be vigilant and really uh, make sure that we keep it going the route that we're going now. Uh, Bear County completed uh, 1,200 vaccines uh, to our, ins to, to our uh, employees under our insurance policy, those that were over 65 and those that had health insurance. Uh, today, uh, University Hospital, Bear County Hospital District, reached a milestone. Uh, they provided a vaccine to the 100,000 uh, pa patients. So, uh, quite, quite, quite an accomplishment in a, in a relatively few, period, few, few weeks. Uh, starting Monday, uh, uh, you know, the weather is going to be bad. There might be ice and, and, uh, and rain in the morning. So, we're uh, not going to open up Wonderland till 12 o'clock instead of 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, those that were scheduled in the morning can still come and we'll get you through and we'll get your vaccination. So 12 o'clock uh, Monday, we will open at uh, Wonderland. We're planning to go back to regular hours Tuesday, assuming that weather is not too bad. There was a good report that came out from 175 uh, health care experts, and most of them were pediatricians focused on public health and stated it was safe to go to school as long as safety measures were taken there, that it's more dangerous for the child at home, mental crisis, including depression, anxiety, isolation, and learning loss. Uh, that, they said, was worse than uh, the, uh, the risk of going to a school with all the safety measures. So that was a significant uh, comment by them. We'll see what the uh, center uh, 
for infectious disease has to say about it. Uh, President <coughs> Biden announced that it will have 600 million doses by July of this year. There's about 300 and some odd thousand uh, people, 300 and some odd million people in the United States, and uh, many of them are below age. So by having that many doses, uh, we'll be able to have two doses for everybody and hopefully uh, be able to get them in their arms as uh, fast as possible. So we're headed in the right direction. Let's keep it up. Yeah, and it will be a cold one uh, this weekend, as you mentioned, Judge. And so we urge everyone to take proper precautions. Uh, some additional information on vaccines. Uh, do uh, d vaccine appointment disruption due to the cold weather. COVID-19 vaccine appointments that were scheduled for the Alamo Dome on Monday uh, have been rescheduled to Friday, February 19th at the same appointment time. So if you were on Monday for your second dose, you're gonna be shifted to Friday. And again, that will be keeping in the same time frame uh, for second dose uh, per the CDC guidance. Uh, people seeking a warm place to stay, uh, please call 211. We do have uh, shelter uh, and beds available for folks who need to get in from out of the cold. Uh, also, you may have seen that WellMed will also be rescheduling appointments uh, previously scheduled for Monday. They will be contacting those who had appointments scheduled for Monday. Finally, on the uh, weather-related uh, cancellations, COVID-19 testing sites located at Cuellar and Ramirez Community Centers will be closed. February 13th through the 15th due to the increment weather. And for the latest information, uh, you can visit our website, covid19.sanantonio.gov. Uh, as you can for all the uh, programming and, and assistance programs available to you during this pandemic, we know many people are struggling to pay uh, the rent or mortgage. There is an emergency housing assistance program uh, that will help you. If you call 311, you can also go to the website, covid19.sanantonio.gov. Also, if you're out of work, Headed in the right direction. That's what County Judge Nelson Wolf said just a moment ago. Just 716 new cases today. Nine new deaths, though, including one that's a pediatric fatality, which doesn't really give us a good idea if it was a, a baby, a toddler, a teenager. It, it just a pediatric fatality of those nine that were confirmed today. Let's take a look, too, at some of the numbers we got on vaccines to kind of yeah. give us a better idea of where we are in our community with this vaccination effort. The mayor was saying that as of the 10th of this month, 186,059 people have received the COVID-19 vaccine and roughly 75,000 at this point have been fully vaccinated. So certainly a long way to go to get our community where they need to be in this vaccination effort. The good news, though, we are almost eclipsing the total number of cases in Bear County with the total number of people who've been vaccinated right now. We have 187,062 total cases that hopefully will be eclipsed within a day or two. All right, let's turn over to weather right now. You heard both the judge and the mayor talk about concerns about the weather out there, some of the delays uh, in giving out some of the vaccinations. Adam, how bad is it going to be? Well, that's a, a relative question. I do think travel will be completely disrupted by Sunday night into Monday morning. We'll have accumulations on roadway. So we're going to take a look at it, this in a little different way with our KSAT snow globe here to talk about exactly how much snow we're thinking. When you quantify it, not by numbers, you know, say there's nothing or just a little frosting on the grass, but you can't really play with it to the level where you could actually mix together enough to make a snowball and have a little snowball fight with your friends. That's what we're looking at. I don't think we'll be able to really make a big snowman out of this, but snowball making snow. Yeah, that's what I think we're really in line for. So in terms of how much that translates to, let's get to the probabilities here. And I do think our most likely scenario is about one to two inches of a combination of sleet and snow when you wake up on Monday morning. That's for most of South Texas. We'll have some higher amounts in the hill country. And there is even that off chance in San Antonio we could have more than two inches. But the most likely scenario is about one to two inches. And that's going to come Sunday night into Monday morning. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, though, because tomorrow on Saturday, a few little pockets of freezing rain and sleet could develop. And I think that's mainly going to be in the afternoon and evening. So just exercise a little more caution if you're venturing out. Keep an eye on the KSAT 12 weather app and update it as well. The newer update fixed a few bugs, by the way. And keep an eye on the radar. We'll keep you posted. But the main event Sunday night into Monday morning. Temperatures all weekend long cold. So a few slick spots Saturday, generally in the hill country, and that's our main concern. And even as we get into Sunday night, 
the Hill Country, I think my main concern for them is power outages because of all the weight already on tree limbs and power lines. But road conditions, I think across all of South Texas will be very poor and you do not want to be, tra be traveling around or plan any travel Sunday night on through Monday morning. And it's going to be hard to melt it off as well as we get into Monday because look at that high temperature, only 29 degrees. I mean, we're looking at temperatures low to mid 30s all weekend, upper 20s the best we can squeeze out on Monday. And there is a slight chance of another wintry mix middle of next week. Hard to believe. Just around the corner, though. Thanks, Adam. All right, Spurs on the rodeo road trip starting in the ATL, Larry. We'll be starting in the ATL. Uh, Devin Vassell is back home. He was born and raised about oh, 30 minutes outside of Atlanta, and he is excited for this game because he's going to get to play in front of family inside the arena. Plus, here in town, Southside girls basketball made some pretty big history last night. Coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. He's a star on the field and a hero in the Houston community. Now, J.J. Watt is looking for another team. The Houston Texans and J.J. Watt have mutually agreed to part ways after 10 seasons, and Watt broke the news on Twitter this morning. He's the Texans' all-time sacks leader with 101. But during the Texans' recent 4-12 season, he made it clear he wasn't happy and that he wanted no part of a rebuild. He's running out of time, and he wants to play for a contender. I'm excited and looking forward to a new opportunity, and I've been working extremely hard. Um, but at the same time, it is, it is always tough to move on. Watt's brother TJ, a linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers, responded to JJ's tweet with this, the rock waving to him, come on. Their brother Derek is a fullback for the Steelers. The Spurs will tip off the rodeo road trip at the bottom of the hour at the Atlanta Hawks, the first game on the NBA schedule tonight. For rookie shooting guard Devin Vassell, this is a homecoming contest for him because he was born and raised some 30 minutes northeast of Atlanta. He's got a lot of family in the area, his brother, sister, grandma, plus aunts and uncles, and they'll get to see him play in person because the Hawks have a 10% capacity at home games. I just found out yesterday that they were going to be able to come and they were so excited because they, of course, they wanted to come and for the longest they kept hearing, you know, we're probably not going to be able to. And then finally, right before I'm getting on the plane, they're like, all right, we can make it happen. So I was like, all right, perfect. And started shooting texts, calling everybody right before we took off. Hawks will host the Spurs tonight at 630. LaMarcus is out again with right hip flexor soreness. In girls high school basketball, Southside beat Jefferson last night 57-49 in a Class 5A by district contest. Led by head coach Jessica Cardenas, the Cardinals have made the playoffs in six of seven of her years, but they were 0-5 in the postseason. So last night, the Cardinals got the monkey off their back with their first playoff win, and it feels great. It means everything because that's our main goal coming into the season, always get past the first round. Well, first of all, make the playoffs. But once we make the playoffs, we hit a brick wall that we just couldn't get through. And then finally, we, we got through. It feels good. It's a good feeling. I've uh, never been in, like, played a playoff game for three years. My first one. And we're going around two my first time. We all worked really hard for it. The atmosphere was, was, was live. Um, we competed. And we showed out. Southside will face the winner of Bernie Champion and Leander Glenn, who tipped off today at 5. Meanwhile, the Reagan Rattlers knocked off steel in the by district round last night. Sophomore Samantha Wagner and junior Christine Iwala were beasts on the boards. Wagner scored a game-high 19 points. Iwala had 15, and the Rattlers won it 45-34. The Rattlers were 8-0 no in district play this season, but lost to Brandeis midway through the district 28-6A playoff seeding tournament, which forced them to draw a tough early-round matchup against Steele. Reagan passed the test, and they're ready for the next challenge. This team that we played, we know them so well, and they're very, very, very skilled girls, every single one of them on that team. And so just being able to execute the game and play well, where we have a lot of confidence coming through. It was definitely a very hard first-round opponent. We put ourselves in this position, but I felt like we redeemed ourselves tonight by coming out and getting this win. So um, it definitely gives the team confidence, but we're, we're ready to keep going. The Rattlers will face either Austin or Vandergrift in the next round, and those two teams play tonight. Playoff action. Love it. Yeah, thanks, Larry. You got it. Our case at Q&A is up next. The impeachment proceedings and the fallout. 
some of the things we're going to discuss in today's case at Q&A. We're joined by UTSA political science professor and the department chair of the Department of Political Science and Geography, John Taylor at UTSA. John, thank you for joining us. Uh, what did we learn? What did we learn over the last few days? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's been a trying time as a political scientist. How about that? Um, what have we learned? We've learned that that at least for the House, the the Judiciary Committee, that's the basically the prosecution team, put together a fantastic case. But we also learned that it doesn't matter. Um, and why doesn't it matter? Because Republicans in the Senate believe, rightly or wrongly, you can make an argument, that the entire trial is unconstitutional. Can you explain the political math that goes into this? It's been so much about the oral arguments over the last couple of days, but we went into this knowing it was unlikely the former president would be convicted. And math has something to do with that. It does, actually. Uh, first of all, it's going to take it would take 67 votes to convict Trump. That's not going to happen. Um, I mean, even with it, even if seven, I mean, the way it's going right now, you might get five, maybe six Republicans peel off and vote with the Democrats for conviction. That's not going to get there. And so the result is, is that Trump is going to be acquitted, like it or not. Um, he, you know, he may he's damaged politically, but he's going to be acquitted and he will view that as a victory. Is there going is there anything beyond a conviction that can happen? I mean, can they I know if there was a conviction, then they could also vote to prevent him from running for future office. This is basically it, though, correct? It pretty much is. I mean, some have made the argument you could invoke uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 3. I think that's a little problematic. Some have argued, well, you could have censure of, of Trump, but he's out of office. Censure is not going to be able to prevent him from, from running for office again. The argument is it's, it's all about the perception of Trump and the aftermath of this impeachment and, it's what, and, and how the evidence has been very damaging. That said, there's a good percentage of his supporters, probably 90 plus percent, who who are basically sticking with him. So it doesn't really matter politically. So do you think that you talk about him perhaps viewing this as a victory in the end? If we've watched these hours and hours of arguments, knowing that it's unlikely anything would come of it, essentially, what's the ultimate impact here? Is there a real impact given your uh, knowledge of political history? Is there an impact to his legacy? There, well, the impact is, let's see, I say wait and see, first of all, in the next few weeks and months, we know most likely that Trump won't be convicted. What will be interesting is, is that will he turn around and parlay this, like I said, into some sort of a sort of arguing that he's, he's been victorious, he's been acquitted. Will he use this as basically the beginning of a, of a roadshow nationally, uh, basically whipping up his, his supporters, raising monies and start trying to influence the 2022 election? Is he also, do you believe he's seriously looking at maybe splitting off from the Republican Party and starting his own party? I mean, it would, there's been a lot of speculation they would start right. something called the Patriot Party or, you know, something, it's something else. Are we looking at a modern day Whig Party coming up here? Honestly, I don't think so. I mean, Trump has basically captured the Republican Party. Now, there are disaffected members of the Republican Party. They may peel off to th form a third party. The problem is in the United States, third parties are usually not successful. The last last successful, truly successful third party was the Republican Party, which came out of the anti-slave Whigs in the 1850s. Don't hold your breath, this will happen again. I'm curious what you think about those five or six Republicans who may be peeling off and siding with the Democrats here. Is there any real political impact for any Republicans who decide to do that? Well, the political impact might be negative. I mean, for example, Mitt Romney in Utah, um, if he decides to run for re-election, Lisa Murkowski in Alaska is another one. Um, Susan Collins doesn't have to worry for another six years because, because she just got re-elected in Maine. W could it have a political impact on them? Maybe. Um, what's interesting is, is that uh, the Republican Party, is, the National Party, has basically said they're still going to support members who actually voted against Trump in both the House impeachment and in the Senate. Um, so th they're wanting to stick together politically, um, primarily because they, they want to gain control of the U.S. House and U.S. Senate again. How about some of the House managers of this impeachment trial that have uh, taken this to the floor of the Senate, including Joaquin Castro, representative, <laughs> high, this ups his profile. What is the impact for him going forward, do you think, being part of this impeachment process, or is there any? I think there is, actually. I mean, he has definitely improved, uh, not just improved, but 
raised his stature definitely. Um, would it, would he consider maybe running for U.S. Senate against Ted Cruz in a couple of years? Maybe. Um, what do you think about running for for governor in 2022? Don't know, but I mean, he, he has options, I would argue, in this respect. It's possible um, if a Supreme Court seat comes open, perhaps he might be appointed to that. Interesting. Once uh, President Trump lost the election, Joe Biden was inaugurated. There's a lot of talk about where's the GOP go from here. Uh, do you think that what we're seeing in this impeachment trial is any indication of where the Republican Party stands right now? I think it is. It's a case of they're rallying the troops. They're trying to circle the wagons in some respects. They're trying to find, figure out who they are. I, I think they kind of know who they are. They're basically right now, and this is not trying to be offensive, they're beholden to Trump. Trump basically energized the Republican base. He, and, and, and the Republican base are Trump supporters. MAGA is for want of a better term. And so the result is, is that Republican office holders, like Trump or not like Trump, they pretty much have to get in line if they want to be electorally successful in the next two, four or six years. Yeah, if you, I mean, he's he's exerting his influence, as you see, on the floor of the Senate with this impeachment Absolutely. trial. So that kind of tells you all that you need to know right there. Yep. <laughs> Political science professor John Taylor with UTSA. Always appreciate your time, John. Have a great weekend. Pleasure. Y'all too. We'll be right back. It's perhaps as old as the country itself. We're talking about conspiracy theories, misinformation, rumors, innuendo. But when you throw in social media, that's when it can really spread like wildfire. Absolutely. That's the focus of this week's episode of Case That Explains. Those conspiracy theories have been around for hundreds of years, but the recent surge is something new. So we're taking a look this week at the rise of conspiracy theories in the U.S., the rise of extremism as well, specifically the QAnon theory, where did that come from? How did it go from a post on what many would consider a very far corner of the Internet to now being talked about in households, among your friends, in mainstream media? We take a look at what that theory is and how social media has played such a role in creating what it is today. Are there practical tips in this episode for how to kind of decipher where this information is coming from? Absolutely, that's so critical for all of us because more and more people, we're getting information from social media, but there is a word of caution when it comes to that. So what is misinformation? What's disinformation? How do you know the difference? How can you tell when it is either of those things? So in this episode, we do take a look at ways that you can screen that so you can find out if what you're looking at needs to be looked at with a little bit more skepticism and how to have conversations with people in your life, your friends, your colleagues uh, who may be talking about the same information that you believe needs to be looked at a little deeper. And you hate to be a cynic a cynic, cynical about so many different things, but it serves you well when you get your information from certain different sources. Absolutely. There's a reason that there is so much uh, mistrust, distrust out there these days, but there are trusted, reliable sources out there as well. All of that, the focus of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. I hope you get a chance to check it out. Go to KSAT.com slash explains, or you can watch it on the KSAT TV app on any of the devices that you see here. Adam, back to you in the studio. All right, here's a look outside with our live cam. The sun has set, still have the low clouds overhead. We're sitting at 33 degrees and we'll trim off just a few more degrees as we go through the night and into early tomorrow morning. You look at our day today, we started at 32 and only rose a whopping four degrees, making it to 36 for the high temperature. So 30 degrees below average for the high. You look elsewhere, Pleasanton made it to 40 along with Del Rio, Catula up to 43. Most of South Texas spent the day in the 30s. We're going to talk about the wintry precip, the wintry weather, and the colder air on the way coming right up. All right, it's usually a question mark snow. Probably not going to happen. Probably, you know, it doesn't seem as like it, it's that big a question mark right now that we're going to get snow. No, it's not much of a question mark in my opinion. I mean, the way it has been looking and consistently looks, especially with our cold air in place and cooling air above us is what's key from about 3000 feet up to about 8000 feet. That's about the layer that's really important. And so it looks like that's going to cool off and that would lead to snow Sunday night. All right, let's get right to it. start with temperatures. Look at that. We're below freezing in the hill country. Still been below freezing all day long around Bear County. 33 Randolph, 34 Helotus, 33 even in Rio Medina and Pleasant. 
pleasant in 37. It's cold, no matter which way you cut it, it's cold. Temperatures falling into the low 30s tonight, upper 20s by tomorrow night. And look at Monday and Tuesday. We'll be down in the teens for morning low temperatures. So a hard freeze on the way. Anticipate that hard freeze. Take the necessary precautions over the weekend so you're prepared for the hard freeze, you know, people, pets, plants, pipes, etc. Let's take a look at our weather pattern. Talk about the systems on the way. So the system that helped get our rain and freezing rain yesterday, that's now moving out of here. It's not influencing our weather much. The next system is basically in the desert southwest. That's going to give us a few little hit or miss pockets of sleet and freezing rain tomorrow. And then the main event that's still out over the Pacific moving toward the Pacific Northwest. So let's talk about this in our future cast. Cloudy tonight, cloudy all weekend long. The big question mark for tomorrow is when and where will those clouds drop some really cold rain? I think as we get into the afternoon and evening, we'll have a few pockets of cold rain and even freezing rain develop. And notice by 9 p.m. the future cast is showing that accumulations will be very light. Nonetheless, that could still be problematic. So it's one of those game time decisions if you're venturing out uh, tomorrow afternoon. Keep an eye on the radar. Keep an eye on the KSAT 12 weather app and we'll keep you up updated on what's going on out there. The exact location is still going to be very hit or miss. The big concern though is the hill country already icing on all the trees and power lines. If we get any more on them, they'll start to come down and power outages are a big concern of mine as we get into the weekend for the hill country for San Antonio. I don't anticipate widespread outages, but the hill country once we get into Sunday night, look at this by sunset. That's when the sleet and snow start to move into town and overspread South Texas. There'll be some pockets of heavier activity as well. That's all of course game time as well. Once the system's underway, we'll know, but in terms of a General rule of thumb, we're expecting about one to two inches here. You get up into the hill country, parts of the hill country, and about two to three inches of additional sleet and snow on top of the ice that's already in place. So unfortunately, that can weigh down those limbs even more and some of the power lines, and that could become problematic. And again, this is for Sunday night into Monday morning. So one to two inches enough to cause the roadways to be slick and impassable in many spots. 34, the high tomorrow and Sunday. We'll be in the low to, low to mid 30s pretty much all weekend. Sunday night into Monday, well, of course, that's when we're expecting the main event. Monday, a high temperature only in the upper 20s. So let's break it down for you this way. On Saturday, just spotty icing here and there. A few slick spots. The main concern will be in the hill country. We get into Sunday evening and that wintry mix starts around sunset. Road conditions will be deteriorating quickly Sunday night. And our big concern is travel across all of South Texas and, of course, the potential for power outages in the hill country. Uh, a few more tips, pool pumps, if you have them, keep them running, because when we get that cold like next week when we're in the teens, if there's water sitting in them and it's not moving, it can freeze and be an expensive repair. Windshield wipers Sunday night, if you park outside, leave them up so they don't freeze to your windshield. And if you don't have a snow scraper, or a sturdy spatula, Sometimes does the trick. I can say that from experience. Don't use a credit card, okay? I guarantee you it's going to break. Temperatures falling off, as I said, will be down in the teens by Monday morning and Tuesday morning. I Just, used a CD one time. Oh, no, no. How'd was, that go? Yeah, how'd that end? It's a CD, so what does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was just in the glove box. Yep. It wasn't one of your Reba or Dolly ones? No. Okay. Absolutely Obviously, not. Obviously, you would have been Steve. heartbroken. A mixed CD from an ex-boyfriend? That's right. We'll be right back. Possibly, yes. <laughs> yeah. New at six, she's struggled with chronic illness most of her life, has needed hundreds of blood transfusions. Now a 20-year-old woman who just received her second liver transplant, teaming up with her parents to give back and pay it forward. While the woman's parents donate blood hoping to save lives, she's focused on inspiring others to do the same. Here's Devin Clark. Blood is life, blood is love. With liver diseases such as autoimmune hepatitis and primary sclerosis cholangitis, Hagen Hill has needed blood transfusion since the age of six. Hospital stays, uh, we 
were constantly in and out. When she was 14, internal bleeding forced the immediate need for a liver transplant. Then added conditions such as ulcerative colitis and severe anemia led to Hill needing another liver transplant and countless more blood transfusions while she waited. With the lack of donors, unfortunately, a lot of people succumb to their disease. The coronavirus helped spike the local demand for blood up by 35% within a year. With less blood available, Hill's chances at life was even more bleak until age 20 when she received a Christmas miracle. Hagen successfully had her transplant. It was a living donor transplant at University Hospital here in San Antonio. And she received that December 22nd. The living donor who shared his liver happened to be her boyfriend's best friend. Knowing blood donations kept Hill alive has inspired her parents to do the same. We all have it. We all need it to live. And trust me, when you see the life start to drain from a loved one's face, you pray there will be enough of it. And when Hill is strong enough, the proud product of Texas A&M hopes to dedicate her life to working with others who have rare diseases too. And to help persuade more people to donate, now through Monday, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is giving donors a $20 Amazon gift card. They're really hoping that more people can find it in their hearts to give the very thing that makes them keep beating. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Of course, for the very latest on the weather, cancellations and all that comes with it, KSAT.com has your information. Thanks so much for watching. See you at 10.